super excited for everyone to be here today. My name is Jeannie Rosner. I am the founder and organizer behind Soul Food Salon, where our mission is to educate and empower us all to live healthier lives. We hold monthly events and we also put out a health and wellness newsletter called Soulful Insights a few times a month. Our hope is to put out the word of perhaps something that's interesting or health related and then really give you takeaways and take home messages on how to combat whatever the issue might be. We're very active on social media, mainly Instagram, but we have a YouTube channel and we're also on Facebook and everything there is at Soul Food Salon, all one word, so follow along. Um, each year, we partner with a different nonprofit, and this year we are partnered with Fresh Approach, which is a local uh, Bay Area nonprofit where they're helping to bring food, um, healthy food, to food insecure areas. So we are helping fund the project of uh, their mobile farmer's market in Redwood City. We started that up in October, actually, and it's been running, it runs every week on Thursdays, and it's providing a great service with fresh local produce to this at need uh, community. We've raised from the Soul Food Salon community over $18,000. So thank you to everyone who's made donations so far. Uh, please feel free to make further donations. Uh, you can do that from my website, which is soulfoodsalon.com. And in the uh, middle of the main page, there's a little blurb about Fresh Approach. And then um, you can make a donation directly there. There's a link that they made specific for Soul Food Salon. So our next event is on Monday, April 4th with Erin Gleason. She is a, a photographer and a cookbook author. Her, her stuff is called The Forest Feast. And she has a new cookbook coming out, which is Road Tripping Through California. And it's actually gonna be live, which I'm super excited. Uh, so I will send out an email with all of her, all of her information and uh, where you could register, but it is live. So those that are uh, long distance, unfortunately, unless you wanna to come to the Bay Area, uh, you will not be able to join us, but come to the Bay Area and join us, that would be awesome. So today I have the pleasure to introduce you to uh, Dr. Ailey Cohen. She's triple board certified in internal medicine, integrative medicine and rheumatology, an unbelievable rock star. And then she shares another, uh, wears another hat, which is um, an environmental health educator and advocate. And so she's going to share with us today ways that various toxins we are exposed to on a daily basis and ways that we can change some of our lifestyle habits to hopefully rid some of those toxins in our life. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, I think this is a really critical topic. I have been shouting on mountaintops everywhere that I'm asked to speak, um, including and especially schools, middle schools, high schools, colleges, medical schools, and colleagues in the healthcare field. Um, environmental health is incredibly important. It is a uh, very big part of our chronic health issues today acute and chronic, I should say, also with asthma and allergies and those type of illnesses. So let's get started. Okay. Let me see. Okay, here we go. So to begin with, I wanted this slide on board because I wanted to show just the sheer number of things that we put in, on, and around our bodies. Um, on a daily basis, I calculated for the TED Talk I did um, about 30 or so chemicals, whether they were good, bad, or ugly, things that we put on our skin, things that are feminine care products, such as tampons, um, things like, you know, cleaning products, even, you know, supplements that have chemicals within them, medications, sunscreen, makeup, body spray for the guys. I mean, it really just, the list goes on and on and on. And I think it's really important to understand that, you know, at this point, we are just inundated with chemicals from everything you can think of, especially since this really exploded in the 1940s and 50s, World War II, um, chemicals that were designed for everything from pesticides for people who were traveling overseas, uh, soldiers that needed to deal with pestilence and infection. Um, but also chemicals that were created for plastics to help with food storage, um, chemicals that keep uh, fragrances going in it called phthalates. So there was lots of different chemicals designed for different purposes. And of course, at that time, they weren't designed for safety or, uh, you know, had any requirements for testing. And that is still the case today, unfortunately. 
So why should we care about these chemicals? Let me give you some statistics just to kind of um, let that settle in. There are now over uh, 95,000 chemicals that are approved for commercial use um, in the United States. Um, and really just a handful have been tested for neurodevelopment and reproductive toxicity. I mean a handful, I mean a real handful. Um, in, the United, in Europe, they're much more rigorous, uh, have greater regulatory oversight as to what chemicals are allowed in the products that go into their um, products that they sell on the shelves. Um, each day, the United States imports about 42 million pounds of synthetic chemicals. Each year, about 1,000 new chemicals are put into use. About 15 to 20 new polymers are patented in the United States every week. There are likely over 1,000 chemicals now known to be endocrine disrupting chemicals, also known as EDCs. Again, likely because these are chemicals that have been tested through third party academic centers, uh, not through manufacturing themselves. And in fact, manufacturers have no requirements to do so in the United States to test their chemicals. It's typically done by academic centers, which requires lots of funding. Um, and so it's really not an efficient system. We have over 62,000 chemicals that were grandfathered in um, over the past you know, 75 years. Um, and we've really never had any strict oversight. The 1976 Toxic Substance Control Act, uh, which was under the Ford administration, uh, really didn't do much to change the requirements for chemicals before they go into our products in terms of uh, required testing. Only five chemicals have ever been uh, partially restricted uh, but not typically banned from the United States, although DDT was, um, PCBs, um, hexavalent chromium, dioxins are a handful of uh, chemicals that have been greatly restricted, um, but they're still being used in other parts of the world, certainly DDT. So um, we need to really be thinking about all of these different exposures and, and how long they've been on our market and in our products. Now, to be fair, it's important to understand that it's not just chemicals that affect our outcomes for health. It's really this intricate dance between our lifestyle, our environment, and our genetic makeup. So often genes will tee things up as to whether or not you're going to be susceptible to that exposure and whether that exposure may or may not express disease or illness. Um, and I think that's what we need to understand is that's our exposome. Our exposome is the culmination of a lifelong, uh, a lifetime of exposures in conjunction with our dietary or lifestyle behavior and also our genetics. Um, so there's no slam dunk cause and effect. However, there are a few things that are direct links, one of which is lung cancer and smoking, which is considered to be a one-to-one -one cause and effect. Um, as well as uh, UV radiation that causes uh, skin cancer. But there's not many things else that actually can be considered a one-to-one -one direct cause. Um, and that's because, again, there are confounders to our lifestyle, our genetics, and, our, and, and other, other factors. So what are endocrine disrupting chemicals? As I mentioned, these are a specific class of chemicals that can affect the human endocrine system. They may interfere with the body's endocrine system, but also produce adverse developmental, reproductive, neurologic, uh, and immune effects in both humans and wildlife. Um, we know the World Health Organization and the UN Environmental Program have called EDCs a global threat that should be addressed. Um, and there's a plethora of position statements from not only uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of, of Obstetricians, Obstetrician Gynecologists, Reproductive Medicine, the Endocrine Society, all of which are very aware and, and uh, fully informed and in terms of their understanding of the effects of these EDCs and have made position statements over the last decade, uh, maybe even less than the last decade. But essentially, uh, these chemicals are real. They are part of almost every aspect of our daily living and they do have health consequences to exposures. Now, how do these um, chemicals work? Endocrine disrupting chemicals, again, the ones we know of, not the ones that have yet to be tested, which includes about 95,000 of them or 94,000 you know, uh, chemicals, is the fact that they have been discovered to work at very, very, very small amounts, parts per million, parts per trillion, parts per billion, 
uh, equivalent to perhaps a drop of water in you know 10 uh, Olympic sized swimming pools. They work like hormones. Hormones, which are basically chemical messengers in the human body that travel around from different organs and really create physiologic change in the human body, whether it's growth and development, whether it's brain development in utero, whether it's uh, sex differentiation of the brain or the body parts uh, in utero, whether or not it's um, the development of bone strength or breakdown, such an os as uh, bone as bone building, as well as osteoporosis, fertility, breastfeeding, all have to do with hormones. Sugar, um, insulin is a hormone that, that allows sugar to be um, compartmentalized into the tissues to be broken down. So we all need insulin to survive. But really fat tissue as well can get larger and smaller based on exposure to endocrine disruptors too, because these chemicals have been found to mimic hormones in the body the endocrine system of the body, which is made up of hormones. So essentially the way these guys work is that instead of what we normally would consider classic toxicology uh, on the left, which is the dose makes the poison. Let me see if I have a, here it is. The dose makes the poison was Paracelsus back in the 15th century, um, where you know the ex amount of exposure you have to something the more you have, the more you're going to see an effect from it, whether that's, you know, drinking alcohol and getting sick on your 21st birthday, whether it's eating too much cake uh, and getting a bellyache, you know, the idea that the more you are exposed, the more you're going to have those findings or those results of um, harm. Well, in fact, endocrine disrupting chemicals have been found to do something pretty sneaky. And that's why it's been such a, you know, a uphill climb to convince most of the world uh, at the early stages that this is what happens, but essentially they work like hormones, these endocrine disruptors. Um, and what that means is that at very low levels, as you can see here, I don't, oh, here's my pointer. At very, very low levels, you can see some of the same effects as you do at very high levels, same here, same on this U curve. And they call that non-monotonic as opposed to monotonic, which is the dose makes the poison, a linear type of progression of exposure. And what's important is, you know, hormones were conserved over anthropology, over, ye over evolution, um, in terms of being able to do really remarkable physiologic change in the human body using very little energy. And that's why hormones are so exponentially powerful. And in fact, these chemicals can disrupt that messaging, whether it's decreasing the amount of hormone, decreasing the amount of receptors, um, but it's disruption, which I think is a brilliant term. And, um, you know, instead of just, you know, very narrow, it was designed to be a very broad uh, descriptor of these chemicals. And that, in fact, has proven to be important because there's still new ways that we're finding those disruption, the disruption is occurring. And as I mentioned, the, you know, the human uh, endocrine system is just so uh, vulnerable. Um, we know that even in utero, this was the cover of Time magazine, that, you know, anyone who's exposed, any fetus that's exposed to anything in life, and that includes stress, that includes a lot of different, uh, you know, environmental health components, not just chemicals, it includes you know, stress, exercise, uh, light exposure, you know, noise exposure, um, poor sleep, all those are considered in my world, environmental health exposures, not just chemicals, as well as radiation. But you can see that the in utero environment is just so critically vulnerable. Um, and we now know that there are effects from these chemicals, especially because they can cross the placenta into um, a growing fetus. We know this, and I'll use one particular well-known study it was in 2005, Environmental Working Group or EWG.org, great organization. Um, they analyzed the blood of 10 uh, random newborns. Uh, it was the cord blood. Um, and some of these moms were super strict about their diet and environment, some of them weren't, but 10 random newborns, their cord blood and found over 287 chemicals. And on average, there were 200 chemicals in each newborn's cord blood. Um, and that's you know about 200, 212 industrial chemicals. Um, and some of those chemicals were actually uh, banned 30 years prior to the study. So we now know that the placenta is not capable of managing such an onslaught of environmental chemicals. And that just makes it even more important to share with um, pre-pregnant and pregnant women as they move forward if they choose to do so. 
Now, this quote I find fascinating. I use it in all my talks because this was um, from Irva Hertz Picciata, who runs um, the University of California at Davis uh, Tender Program, which looks at a lot of exposures in utero. And what she said is neuros, neurons are being formed at a rate of 250,000 per minute on average over the course of a pregnancy. And that's a lot of opportunity for things to go awry. And in fact, it's panned out that, you know, certain exposures, certainly certain windows of uh, uh, in utero exposure have different areas of risk. Um, certain organs are, you know, organs are formed in the first trimester and certain various changes go on. We know this from fetal alcohol syndrome that's been well studied. So it's just another reason, again, to be well informed as a pre-pregnant or pregnant woman in, in addition to any other uh, developmental age, of course. What's important to know also is, and this kind of threw me off, I couldn't believe this, but really when a pregnant woman is exposed to anything, you know, be it famine, as in with, you know, the Dutch famine of World War II in the Netherlands, where they looked at, you know, the stress uh, of, of uh, famine compared to women who are pregnant that did not have the stress of famine, and they followed generations out. But when you have exposure, and of course, the women who are exposed to stress, really, those offspring had successive generations of additional health risks, including uh, chronic heart disease and, um, and other issues. Uh, we've seen this with drug exposures like diethyl silvestrol, which was a drug given in the 1950s through 70s to women to keep them from miscarriaging. But when we know that a mother or a pregnant woman is um, you know, exposed, it's not just she that's exposed, it's also her fetus, as you would imagine, but it's the product reproductive cells, the third generation, which are the ovaries that hold the eggs, so the eggs are exposed, as well as the primordial um, germ cells of the testes. So we really need to consider not just one generation or two with pregnant women, we need to think of three generations. Now, interestingly enough, children are also a very important, once they're born, we have to take you know, some, some consideration into their exposures because uh, as compared to adults, they have more, um, you know, greater exposure to anything, uh, particularly chemicals, because they are pound for pound. They have, um, you know, smaller uh, BMI or greater BMI. Um, they are close to the ground. Um, hand to mouth behavior, of course, with kids, they're putting everything in their hand in their mouths, which includes dusty, chemical ridden, you know, kind of toys that sit on the floor, and that we'll talk about in a bit. But also, um, you know, they have a lack of variety in their diet, which is really quite important because um, diet can do a considerable amount of um, benefit to a human being who has been exposed to chemicals. There are remarkable studies showing that, you know, eating green leafy vegetables uh, with B, you know, vitamin B9, which is folate, uh, antioxidant foods, um, you know, things that kids don't typically love, but essentially there's components of our nutrition that can be off, offset the risk from these chemical exposures and can thwart the methylation, the genetic um, exposome changes that can go on. Um, also, children um, have immature metabolism, so they don't metabolize some of the chemicals that uh, adults do, just in terms of liver size and the chemicals that the liver uses to break down um, exogen you know, exogenous chemicals or, or synthetic outside of the body chemicals. And they will have more you know, future years of life. So they are going to be exposed at a younger age to chemicals that many of us may not have ever seen, uh, certainly not during these very vulnerable um, windows of development. And again, periods of susceptibility, just to kind of hit home in other areas of our development is not just prenatal and neonatal exposure, but pu puberty, which is why I you know, do a lot of work with high schools and college students is because this is an area where hormones are really creative, uh, created very exponentially. And in fact, that's where, you know, all of these vulnerable windows, including menopause, where, you know, some of these chemicals may exert more um, harm. And so it's not just what we're exposed to, it's also these windows of vulnerability um, when growth and development and hormonal change is so dramatic. And I put this slide up because, you know, since breast cancer is something that, um, you know, I get very uh, wrapped up in given family history and just given the pervasiveness of breast cancer, even with my patients, 
you know, I want people to understand, you know, 90% of breast cancer is associated with environmental exposures. Um, again, it's not just the genetic effects, it's also the lifestyle we lead. Um, and it's also the chemicals that we're surrounded by. We know that there are known risks, as I mentioned, DES, diethylstilbestrol was um, linked, you know, a medication that was given to women intentionally to help with nausea and miscarriage. Um, those women have had successive generations of higher rates of breast cancer, not only in the women exposed because they had mostly adenocarcinoma of the vagina, but they also have higher rates of breast cancer in successive generations, um, even two and three generations later. Also, um, uh, infertility um, and some other um, chronic health conditions. But we know ionizing radiation can be a risk for breast cancer, given people who have had radiation therapy to the chest um, for any reason, uh, particularly the, um, the lymphomas, um, smoke, tobacco smoke, uh, first, second, and third hand smoke. Alcohol has been linked as a, as a risk, depending on how much, of course. And then there's these occupational exposures. But I wanted people to also know the suspected risk can, can, uh, you know, are listed here with a whole host of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, certainly BPA, which was sort of the first one in line, phthalates, triclosan, which was taken out of uh, liquid soaps in 2016, but still can, are still part of thousands of products. Flame retardant chemicals in couches. So I often talk about, and in my book, talk about how to read a label to make sure that um, you're choosing couches and material, uh, you know, home furnishings that do not have these added chemicals parabens, the perfluoracles, which are the uh, PFOS chemicals, the ones that are used for nonstick um, non pans, um, that are used for stain guard chemicals that you spray on couches, on clothing, on, on chairs from manufacturers, um, Gore-Tex and you know, rain gear, anything that's waterproof. And then the PCBs, which still linger in the ocean, but also in many schools and are part of fixtures. So, you know, we wanna get a full history on, if you're a healthcare provider listening to this, you certainly wanna get some degree of um, an environmental health assessment when you see anyone, because it matters where people spend time, because that may be the one place that you can intervene and reduce risk. Now, as an immune system doctor, as a rheumatologist, I'm seeing, of course, greater and greater numbers of people with autoimmune disease, with immune disease uh, issues, not just autoimmune. Um, I'm seeing more uh, allergies, inflammation. I'm seeing a whole host of chronic diseases that are metabolic that are certainly linked to these environmental exposures. Um, you know, we know that many of these chemicals can actually raise the baseline level of inflammation in the body. We saw this with COVID-19. The more co comorbidities that people experience, um, the more likely they had worse outcomes. And it was linked to this inflammatory, this baseline inflammatory response that was sort of simmering and going on in many people's bodies. Certainly if you have uncontrolled diabetes as opposed to controlled diabetes, you know, certainly if you had, um, you know, sort of disease that was not well controlled either by diet, lifestyle, or medication. But the idea is that these endocrine disrupting chemicals um, really do raise the inflammatory baseline. And that's a real problem, which is why this work is actually so important, not just for COVID, but for anything that we might experience in the future from an infectious issue, as well as chronic disease or allergy issue. So in terms of the precautionary principle, this is what a lot of work that I do really stands on because we don't always have billion million dollar studies that are double-blinded placebo controlled, who's gonna pay for them, they're very hard to set up, they're very hard to get funding for. And so when you talk about precautionary principle, which is what I do in my book and at talks with, with everybody is that you don't always have to have a one-to-one -one cause and effect relationship to really make good decisions. And so this quote says, when an activity raises threats of harm to human health or the environment, precautionary measures should be taken even if some cause and effect relationships are not fully established scientifically. And it just makes good sense to remove things from your body, from your environment, so you don't breathe them in. Um, and that's really um, something to be thinking about when making decisions, simple decisions. So 
Um, when it comes to what we can do about it, this is sort of the solution section, I hope. Um, we want to know where these chemicals come from, if we can, and that's about surveying our environment. We want to know how to avoid those products and find substitutes that may do the same job but have far less risk in terms of human health and exposure. Um, and we want to know how lifestyle plays a role in all this, including getting enough sleep, getting enough drinking water that's filtered drinking water, getting enough exercise to send blood flow around the body, through the liver, to detox the body when it has better blood flow, to get enough sleep where we actually get um, a sort of a cleansing of our, of our, our spinal fluid and our, um, um, our fluid around the brain, which actually helps to clean our body at night while we sleep. So it's not just, you know, feeling refreshed and our better memory and cognition, all that. It's also about really giving our body the time that it needs to, to clean from, you know, environmental exposures. So I always say do a survey of your body, what you put on in and around your body, especially also women with personal care products. Um, very important area of exposure that people don't often think about. And if you're a mother, a father, you have women you love, just really consider the feminine care product aspect. So diet is typically what people talk about first. I tend to either talk about diet or water, which we're going to get to, but let's talk about diet. There are so many things to think about when it comes to environmental exposures to harmful chemicals in food. It's not just, you know, should I be having more fats or protein or carbs? That's certainly a very big discussion and very important discussion. But what I like to argue is that the quality of your food is actually so critically important um, and that there are really inexpensive ways to get high quality food that are nutrient rich, again, to help the body support itself against chemicals that could be harmful. Um, and that you can do this very reasonably um, through frozen USDA organic choices because they're flash frozen with all the nutrient value. But we wanna think about other aspects that expose our body through diet and that's food packaging. You know, what are we cooking our food in, in terms of pans, whether they're nonstick or stainless steel? How are we storing our food in terms of plastic containers versus, you know, um, you know, using bamboo for our, our utensils, using, uh, excuse me, aluminum foil versus, um, you know, brown paper versus silicone versus, you know, other types of plastic. So there's just so much where the chemicals can infuse into what we eat independently of our food choice in terms of vegetables versus fast food. So you really wanna think about all of those things when you're looking at the whole setup of your diet. Of course, the US diet is pretty, um, pretty poor for 75% of, of, of the Western world, right? Um, you know, it consists of processed food mostly because it's cheap. It's low calorie, it's accessible. Um, you know, it, this is a real problem. You know, when you have unhealthy food that's cheaper, people tend to go in that direction. And I understand that. Um, the idea is how do you make healthy food cheaper and be savvy about it? And that's what I hope to address in, in the book we created called Non-Toxic, is really understanding the idea that you can also get conventional fruits and vegetables and wash them off to get pesticides off through baking soda uh, and warm water or white vinegar and warm water. And so I wanted people to have do-it-yourself information on how to create washes that were not you know, toxic, but also not have to be obligated to getting access to organic foods, be it frozen, which is much more accessible in big box stores versus, you know, conventional, um, you know, produce that you get locally and don't have access necessarily to organics for fresh. But the idea is everyone should have the ability and the right to clean their food, no matter how they want to do it. Um, when it comes to food additives, we have literally thousands uh, of chemicals added to our processed food. It's a $35 billion market. Um, in 1978, there were somewhere around 35 commonly added food additives on record. Now there are over 11,000. Um, so it's really important to keep in mind that these chemicals really have just infiltrated every aspect and including our food. So that's certainly one place people can start on their journey. I said that, you know, our nutrition is poor when humans are nutrient sufficient. However, they are better equipped to handle the toxin exposure. And this has been, you know, shown, as I mentioned, with antioxidant rich foods in both mouse, uh, rats and, and human studies. This has been found uh, in young children 
um, who are switched to organic diets, not just because they have less chemicals, but also because of the nutrient rich value of having iron and vitamin C in those, in those um, foods. And actually blood lead levels are, um, you know, they can be blocked in terms of elevated blood lead levels by nutrient sufficient diets in children. Um, certainly if you're iron deficient can also affect that. Methylmercury can be affected um, by a nutrient rich diet, uh, PCBs, um, BPA. I mean, it's really remarkable that it's not just taking away the chemicals that are in pesticides, but it's also adding the chemical, the uh, nutrient value to our food to help us fight what we are exposed to and may have no control over. So I talk about um, cruciferous vegetables as being some of the most important, uh, you know, practical ways to help your body detox. I don't believe in diets necessarily. I don't believe in cleanses. I don't believe in powders and shakes. And I believe in real food um, as best you can. Certainly powders and shakes that are healthier than fast food can be helpful, but they also have their issues with sugar and chemicals that are not always addressed. So cruciferous vegetables are so many to try um, as long as you can either wash them off of pesticide residues or choose USDA or organic. These are remarkable in that they have chemicals like sulforaphane, which help phase two detoxification of the liver, which is a process that helps to remove some of these chemicals, break them down into less aggressive, less harmful components. Um, and also they can help inhibit, again, DNA methylation, which can lead to certain cancers. Um, there's chemicals like indole-3-carbinol, which is a natural anti-cancer compound. Um, so it's not just getting these into your body, but it's also cooking them the right way. You don't want to steam them or cook them so, so much that they lose uh, some of their, 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 uh, their antioxidant ability. Um, but you want to certainly, um, you know, get these into your system. The fiber is important also as well to transit the body for reduction of colon cancer and some other cancers, including breast cancer. So this is the winner group. Um, and it's just a matter of finding the right way to cook and clean and um, get them in your body on a regular basis. Food storage, can't go without saying food storage is such a big issue. Obviously, Tupperware party in the 1950s, um, you know, this made sense to a lot of people. Um, and it still does to a lot of people because you wanted something light and easy to wash. But remember, when you get a brand new set of you know, clear plastic storage where it's usually clear until it's heated up in your dishwasher or nicked up a bunch of times because that material, that matrix plastic is actually so friable, it will change color and become opaque within a few washings at high heat. So knowing that you want to stick with materials for storage that aren't going to break down, such as glass, such as stainless steel, um, things that just have a stronger matrix and don't add their components into the food and drinks that they carry. The synthetic age was filled with, you know, chemical miracles, uh, you know, melamine dishes, you know, polyethylene hula hoops, polystyrene cups, styrofoam, DDT sprays, materials like Teflon, saran wrap, formica, naugahyde, vinyl, nylon, acrylic, polyester, plexiglass, Fuels were made, you know, uh, more um, efficient with tetraethyl fuels, uh, you know, additives, solvents for better cleaning. These are all coming around to kind of bite us in the butt because a lot of these chemicals are pretty harmful. And we didn't know that we had to make them through green chemistry and understand their full lifespan and their full risk to human health and, and animal health. So um, between 1940 and 1960, the US output of plastics increased from 300 million to 6 billion pounds. So that's what we did to ourselves. And now we kind of have to um, figure out a way to get out of this. Phthalates, just to give you an idea, are just one class of um, synthetic chemicals. They've been well studied in terms of their relationship to affecting um, you know, in, in utero exposures, affecting newborn uh, cognition in terms of following them out, in terms of brain development also the uh, genitalia of young boys that um, are born to women with very high levels of phthalates. This is all the work of Dr. Shauna Swan um, and her colleagues, as well as international colleagues that she's had and done remarkable work on this area. So where are phthalates located? Phthalates tend to make um, plastic soft. So it's found in tubing of, in hospital systems. Um, it's found in nail polish to make nails not chip or hairspray not crack. 
it's found in fragrances such as body sprays. I have two boys and they, boy, they want to smell good. They're teenagers. And essentially a lot of phthalates are added to anything with the word perfume or fragrance. Um, you can smell them coming down the road. So this is one of those things where you have to really look up products and we'll talk about that. But the idea is that phthalates are added to make scents last longer and to remain stronger. Um, they're added to any soft, pliable rubber um, and plastic cell phone cases, vinyl shower curtains, vinyl flooring, chemicals in, in you know, candles, um, air fragrances, even the most expensive perfumes, phthalates, because that's their job. Um, among other things. How do you avoid phthalates? You avoid phthalates by not heating things in plastic because most plastics won't tell you if phthalates are involved. But if you have uh, a three and a triangle underneath your products, such as a food container, um, that's part of the recycling codes that were designed in 1988. Um, so you can actually look for products that have the three and the triangle, that's vinyl, PVC vinyl. You can remove toys that are old prior to 2000 and uh, six, which um, really had a lot of the worst phthalates in them. After 2006, the U.S. banned some of the phthalates that are used in children's toys. So you got to watch for hand-me-downs. Hand-me-down toys can be problematic if you don't know when they were developed or um, anything from overseas, 99 cent stores, be very careful of phthalates because they're in most of those, well, I can't say most, but they're in a lot of those products, especially toys um, you know, be, beads for, you know, Mardi Gras, that kind of thing. So you don't want kids chewing on those. Um, and of course, any vinyl products, flooring, personal care product um, have these chemicals, phthalates. Um, so try to remove them if you can. And again, the plastics resins codes were designed to save money for the plastics industry. However, we can use them to, you know, to our own benefit for human health by knowing what's in these plastics as best we can. So the general rule is to try to avoid numbers three, five, and six. Uh, I'm sorry, three, six, and seven. So three would be vinyl. Six would be polystyrene, which is a known carcinogen, styrofoam. Um, and number seven, which is often BPA, is under other. So if you can avoid three, six, and seven, that's a general way to go. Most of the uh, plastics we use are generally one, two, and five. And in terms of BPA, you want to get rid of, if you can, uh, receipts that actually uh, bisphenol A is an endocrine disruptor that was one of the work, first one well studied. My co-author for this book, uh, Non-Toxic, and in the textbook actually is renowned for his work on BPA, bisphenol A, and, and helping to get it removed from the U.S., um, baby bottles in 2012. So he's the guy. Um, and he's remarkable. And his colleagues that help do that research internationally are remarkable. So BPA is in the inside of most cans, if not all of them, pretty much 99.99% of cans, uh, either your diet soda, Pepsi, you know, organic canned foods. It's the cans that are lined with this plastic. Um, often BPA. So it gets into the food and drinks. So I often try to get people to move from canned foods, if possible, again, socioeconomically sensitive information here, but you want to make sure people know that um, frozen foods that are moved into glass to heat up is just as acceptable, if not better. Um, baby formula often has BPA lining. Um, store receipts, seal ink with BPA, printer ink, anything that has heat printer ink currency, parking tickets. You wanna see if you can avoid getting them on your hands, wear band-aids if you work as a checkout cashier um, is what I tell my patients. And also you know, get electronically emailed receipts, carry an envelope with just receipts if you need to get the hard copy. So those are just some of the ways to reduce exposure. Um, again, more, more ways to reduce exposure. But BPA, again, is that seven triangle. So you want to see if you can avoid that in everything you do. There's the seven. Just to give you an idea, I went into, um, I think it was Walmart, and I, there were like 20 different options for you know, applesauce and fruit. And I just went through all of them. And it, you have options. So um, I want people just to be savvy enough to know what to choose. So personal care products, because I have so many slides, I want to keep moving, but personal care products, you know, on average, as I might have mentioned, I can't remember, but basically teenage uh, girls and teenagers use the most personal care products daily than 
any other demographic, adult women use 12 on average and men use on average six. So it's a really important opportunity to talk to everybody, including teenagers about the products that they choose. Um, this was a study just to give people an idea of lipstick in this country, that this was a study that, that looked at, um, I think it was, 30, uh, was it 35 lipsticks and 75% of them were found to have levels, 32 lip products and 75% um, of them were found to have lead detected. We don't have uh, any kind of regulation on lead in our products and lead and mercury are often used to as part of the coloring of many bright lipsticks, for, for instance. Uh, mercury is added as an antibacterial in some eye products and there's really no oversight on this, let alone, you know, pretty much in our drinking water and other places. We know that lead, no level of lead is considered safe, certainly in, in developing fetus and in children. So these are some of the most expensive brands too. So it's not a matter of cost of the product. It's really understanding how to vet your products. These are some of the chemicals just in nail products. And I once had a manicure a couple of years back on my way to a talk on environmental chemicals and she had tremendous rheumatoid arthritis, just anyone could see that. And she had um, no health insurance. She had her kids running around and she was basically exposed to these chemicals all day long. So again, these are not to say it's cause and effect, but it's just a remarkable number of chemicals that are put in things we put directly onto our skin and our young children's skin every day. And I have recommendations for this too, by the way. So I put a lot of recommendations for everyday life in terms of how to get a manicure pedicure safely. Um, or safer, I should say. And, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, highfalutin information here. It's just really just being aware. Um, I look at products on, a, you know, for my high school students, when we do these activities from ewg.org slash skin deep, or their healthy living app, they're free, you can look up your products and choose, you know, better choices. And that's what we do in our classes. Air quality, as I mentioned, you want to be careful of, you know, things that are directly into our, in our environments, just smoking, but there's also secondhand and thirdhand smoke, which is the chemicals that fall onto surfaces after they've been smoked. So, you know, that lands somewhere, those microscopic dust particles, you know, we bring in air fresheners, which are not making our air fresher. Um, they're making it more toxic. We want to open windows, add plants, get rid of synthetic chemicals. If you have the opportunity and ability to change up carpeting and carpet backing, which often have flame retardants or non-stick chemicals, go with um, ceramic floors as opposed to vinyl. There's lots of great choices out there, but it all affects the air quality and our homes are very airtight. So um, that's because of you know, our energy and heating bills and requirements. So we wanna really think about getting more um, airflow through our homes and environment that's, that's better quality. So for air quality, a lot of it's common sense, but you want to remove things that we're adding to cleaners that aerate off. You want to just have simple do-it-yourself cleaning recipes. We have that in the book, or you want to look up um, chemicals uh, or, or products and brands that are done very well through EWG um, or Think Dirty app. Um, and again, vacuuming, using a really good vacuum, vacuum with um, HEPA filter, having an HVAC system that's been regularly changed out, that's your heating air conditioning setup, you can really remove a lot of the air quality, air chemicals that cause um, asthma allergies, um, can worsen emphysema and also lead to in, increased risk for things like depression and other um, metabolic issues as well. Flame retarding chemicals, they're added purposely so that if there's a fire, things won't blow up, but it turns out that that's all a farce, particularly with couches. It was all um, set up in the 1970s uh, by the tobacco industry. We now know that those chemicals get into our bodies. They are endocrine disruptor, disruptors in nature. Um, and you know we need to sort of start to think about removing those. I teach in the book, the different labels. Maybe I have it here. Here's, here's a label and a website, which we have lots of websites that stay kind of evergreen in terms of their upkeep and their updating of their information. But you can read labels now on couches that you buy and choose ones that have no added flame retardant chemicals. 
pesticides. This is actually my daycare that I had with my kids. And I took this picture. I thought I was going to get arrested, but I was just horrified that this was so close to where they played. And they had an X through this picture of children and pets walking. It can't be good. I don't know why this is cute. But anyway, the idea is that um, we need to really think about pesticides. There are so many, um, over 10,000. Um, and we need to really think about not just the active ingredients that are on pesticides labels, uh, which say maybe something very one, one ingredient, but the inert, the when you look in the bottom of a, of a spray of pesticide, whether it's a bug spray, um, any type of um, pesticide, herbicide, especially glyphosate is an herbicide, you need to know that in the inert ingredients can be just as toxic, if not more toxic than the active ingredient. Speaking of glyphosate, this is just to show the increase in glyphosate use in this country just over a 10 year period really. And of course now we're at 2022. So I don't even wanna know what this new data looks like, but you can see it's one of the most widely used herbicides in our country. It's been banned in Mexico. It's been banned potentially, I think in Europe, they're considering it's been banned from various municipalities in Miami. Um, they're considering it in New York, but this is pretty toxic stuff. This is Roundup. It has been banned for, I believe, residential use starting in 2025, if I'm correct. And, but commercially, it's still certainly very pervasive. We want to think about pesticides. We want to think about not just what we think of as, you know, farming pesticides, but what are, what are we spraying in our lawns to keep up with the Joneses? How can we just allow our, our lawns to be cut low and not have to put spray on them, uh, which we carry into our homes and get on our pet's paws and our kids' shoes? And so these are just ways to reduce those exposures in the home. Um, by having a bucket for shoes, you know, there's just a remarkable number of things we can do. And certainly for hobbies like um, gardening, uh, you may want to consider things like um, integrated pest integrated pest management, which is ways to naturally garden with um, uh, you know flowers and plants that that work together, that synergize um, in terms of reducing weeds. Um, so a very important area to go into. Drinking water is my biggest issue. It seems to have risen to the top, uh, no pun intended, but the idea is that drinking water by volume is so critically important. We're made up of 85% water. We need to be thinking about what we drink. We need to think about you know, filtering the water at home. Of course, we travel and we eat at restaurants, so you can't be crazy, but you want to really have a system by which you filter your water, be it a carbon filter, like a pitcher, a faucet versus more extreme and there's variations all the way up in terms of cost and function, which we talk about in our water chapter, all the way up to reverse osmosis, which is the most aggressive way that humans can get their water cleaned in the United States. And actually the pricing has dropped dramatically. So the idea that you can get an RO filter that's certified, NSF certified for 300 bucks, 275, and then have a plumber put it in under your kitchen sink for 150 bucks for one hour, no more, and then 40 bucks a year to you know, kind of change out the cartridges makes sense to me. It's just more upfront costs that people have a hard time thinking about. Um, but it's really just something to really consider considering how aggressive reverse osmosis is. Um, my dad and my brother are both nephrologists and they um, have federally regulated reverse osmosis water required by law for dialysis. And I think if that is the case and, and there's such oversight there, we need to really consider this for everybody. Um, and now it's, it's doable. Water just collects so much junk. We have 160,000 wastewater treatment plants um, that serve 86% of the US population. This is one of the images from our book, Non-Toxic. Um, we mashed up a bunch of different kind of images, but this is really the take home is that our water gets exposed from air quality, air, air pollution chemicals, gasoline runoff, manufacturing runoff, agricultural runoff, sewage. We have people's medications found in, in water treatment plants that actually don't get washed off. The infrastructure is not there to do so. And then we have added chlorinated chemicals and detergents that, re that are required so that we don't have you know, typhoid Mary and, and, you know, these stories and history of major populations being affected by infection. So we need to, so they add those, but they don't get removed after they're added and they travel 20, 30 miles to your home. So you want to really, whether it's a well or it's water treatment, you want to um, 
manage water at the point of use, which is at your sink in your home. And that therefore anyone can really use um, aggressive filtration in their home, no matter where, where their water comes from. Safe Drinking Water Act of 1976, uh, manage only 91 chemicals at these 160,000 wastewater treatment plants. So those are the chemicals that you can see on the left that are looked for and managed and remediated if they run too high, which arguably could be higher than most people would think is good for human health. But in terms of maximum contaminant level, um, you know, that's what they are. Water contaminants before a water treatment plant, these are all the different aspects of chemical chemicals getting into our drinking water before it goes through a water treatment plant. And of course they come out the other side because there's no infrastructure, infrastructure to actually remove those including microplastics and fracking chemicals and coal ash and all the new chemicals we've come up with for COVID-19, the quaternary amines, these are all, they exploded during COVID and they're now making their way into our water system. As I mentioned, great slides I would imagine for every degree of filtration. I don't wanna ever corner people into any one type. And there are different reasons for different types of filtration, whether you're moving, whether you live in an apartment, whether or not you're on the go, whether you have affordability issues. So I just want people to know there's a whole variety. Plastic water bottles, I don't wanna go on too long. There's issues there with the plastics themselves. Water sits in hot plastic in places that are store plastic. And this is not a refrigerated truck. I took this on vacation in, um, where was I? Cape May, New Jersey. It was a hundred degree weather. And I just sat there for half an hour. No one came to lift them up and they did not go into refrigerated trucks. So in terms of drinking water, create a system, fill up at home as much as you can. Um, do not use plastic water bottles because of infection risks. And also, you know, obviously if you're out and about, you can't always do this, but you want to make sure sort of 80, 90% of your water you control on your own at home. Sleep is important, as I mentioned, to clean out chemicals while we sleep. Some sleep recommendations, um, you know, you can take a screenshot, but essentially a lot of it is just common sense. Temperature has to be adequate. You want good quality and quantity of sleep because uh, this plays out into our chemical uh, exposure during sleep. And exercise and sauna, certainly, as we exercise more, blood goes through the liver. We sweat out chemicals um, on our skin. This was done during 9-11 uh, to help with chemical exposure. It's done with methamphetamines. Uh, so we know that physiologically anthropology plays a major role and we can harness this to uh, reduce our exposures. Um, and in general, we wanna watch our smoking and vaping, especially teenagers, we wanna you know, try to reduce that. Medications, I always say, just be very judicious about what you put in your body. They too have their risk. And we have a whole chapter on commonly used medications like statins and proton pump inhibitors and things that have better solutions than medication uh, for most people. Supplements can be used. Um, and the issue with supplements is that quality and quality plays a big role. You don't wanna just go into your big box store and buy fish oil because most of it's junk. You wanna really know brands and understand. I post on this on the smart human, the smart human uh, for Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and the podcast I have called the smart human. And I just posted on fish oil, how to read a label last week um, or two weeks ago. So really good information on just trying to read labels for supplements. But certainly pre and probiotic you know, uh, intake can really help remediate chemicals as well. They do this for super fun sites with bacteria. So we can do this for our gut and protect the gut and our immune system in the process. Medications and EDCs, medications like acetaminophen found to be an endocrine disruptor. Pretty important to try to find other methods of pain control if possible. I was pregnant once, I know it can be painful, but we, we are too easily grabbing for medications when there are just really nice alternatives for most situations. Radiation, again, another environmental exposure I want people to be aware of. We wanna keep phones away from kids' heads given the thin nature of their skulls, the lack of myelin and their development. Um, so it's really important to reduce as much exposure as possible. Um, and there are a whole bunch of tips that we can use 
uh, to do that, including turning, you know, on airplane mode at night, certainly um, downloading games for kids so they don't have to have them Wi-Fi around. We can turn off our Wi-Fi in our homes, keeping phones away from breast tissue in our front pockets for sperm count and sperm quality is quite important. And I have to deal with that with two young boys that have cell phones. So yeah, it's an ongoing issue and battle, I should say. Um, most cell phones are radiation in the middle between ionizing and non-ionizing. And we actually have a whole chapter on radiation because it's just soup to nuts, what it means, why it's important and what to do about it. Um, so another area that we can live with our phones and our technology, but we just need to do it safely. Take home message as we come to an end here, chemicals and radiation are ubiquitous as we know. We wanna think about all the lack of regulation. We have to do this for ourselves. We just have to, that's what really aggravates me is that we can't wait for Godot here. Um, Chemicals get absorbed in many different ways, including the vaginal mucosa. We need to think about that for young women. Um, and you know, these do over time, low level exposures add up to health risks. We're seeing that epidemiologically in a variety of cancers, certainly autoimmune disease. And there are many, many connections to environmental exposures that we have in our book that is just highly referenced if you need to, the data for that. I encourage people not to freak out. Um, I've come full circle from that. I want people to really think about what to be proactive on and get involved in research or education, you know, move the market through purchasing power and, you know, elect people that are going to do well for us in the environment and environmental health. Communicate with others, educate others. It is so critical, um, you know, share small parties and talk to people about this stuff. My resource is certainly happy to share this with Jeannie. And then these are the two books that I'm involved with, one, both of which with, with my mentor and my friend, Frederick Bomsall. He's remarkable. That was a textbook on the left with 26 contributing incredible authors. Um, Maricel Maffini, who does all the research on food additives, Shauna Swan, who does work with phthalates. Um, just the list goes on and on. And then the book on the right is just the two of us and it's the what to do. It's really for every age group, including high school students, including college students, um, any age group, um, pregnant, not pregnant, you name it, uh, has home health, home goods, all the things you need to know to just kind of reduce those exposures. This is my TED talk. Um, if you want to introduce this to kids and, and young people to kind of get an idea of what the actual issue is. And then of course, this is my baby is the smart human on all feeds, uh, the website, but certainly Instagram, Facebook, please share on Facebook, especially because I post Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, really great nuggets, especially Friday, Mental Health Friday. So feel free to, um, you know, share with people the smart human everywhere you can. Definitely, definitely get this book. Um, I'm of a medical background, as you might know, and, but I learned a ton and there's just, just real great, uh, helpful, easy strategies. I think your, your message also is not to be overwhelmed with all of this. Perhaps take right. a survey of like you mentioned, like what, what maybe you can do today. Maybe it's getting rid of the plastic Tupperware. Maybe start with one thing. Don't, don't be overwhelmed. So the reverse osmosis filtering system, many of us are here in California where there is a drought. And I know the reverse osmosis system requires a ton of water, right? So I think that might. So, so here's my answer and it's a great question. So um, for about every, for every one gallon of RO filter water, which means it comes, it gets cleaned through a lot of surface area, certainly several canisters, and then it gets put into a tank, you know, so you're creating water while you sleep. For every one gallon, and it depends on the machine, the capacity is what you're looking for, but depending on the machine and the, and the size of the tank, but every, every one gallon that you create of clean filtered RO water, you're kind of losing about three to five gallons of wastewater. Now, mind you, once the tank is filled up, you're not wasting water. It's not an ongoing process. So you really are not wasting water, in my opinion. Uh, I don't live in California, but this is what I understand from doing a lot of reading on this is that once you create the tank full and you're drawing off that tank, remember, you're only using it for cooking and drinking. You're not showering with an RO filter. That is a whole house filter. I do not actually recommend that. It's very expensive, 10 to 15,000. And people can get shower heads for $20 at Home Depot and Lowe's and whatever for $20 just to screw on carbon head filter. 
which is fascinating. That's what you could do every six months. But the RO filter under your water should not be draining your pocket because you're not using it for more than just drinking and cooking and it fills up to a level and stops. Okay, good to know. I like the shower head suggestion. That's good. Um, something for the audience to, to pay attention to is when it says it's BPA free, often there's other bisphenols as well. And we're not really sure what BPS does to our body. You might be more aware of things, um, Ailey, than I am. But They're just bad. BPS, BPS, <laughs> FIP. So there's a whole bunch of bisphenol similar to thalates <coughs> of them. BPA is just sort of the poster child for the bad guy. And when they say BPA free, even especially on sports water bottles that are plastic, don't buy it. That means that they're having regrettable substitutions, which means it's a whack-a-mole. And so there's other chemicals that are just as bad, actually, now that we know BPS, for instance, um, in terms of endocrine disruption capability as BPA. So go with glass and stainless steel whenever possible. Right. I find it just fascinating um, and disturbing that we are not protected by our government. Does in Europe, you mentioned that, you know, I mean, I know that their criteria is, is higher and more stringent. Do they do a lot more testing than prior to putting mar uh, products on the market? Yes, much more, reg much more rigorous regulatory process, the EU. Um, and so they are up to about 1,200 chemicals that have been tested rigorously and removed or not allowed into, I don't know about not allowed, but removed from the, from the, um, the system there in terms of what they can put into products. Okay. So absolutely more rigorous. Canada does a very good job. Of course, California leads the way with Prop 65. And hopefully because states can override a lot of uh, state uh, national requirements. Look at California, they have a lot more aggressive way of screening for their state than other states. So hopefully the rest of the country will follow suit and use them as sort of the beacon of, of change. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions someone asked was about silicon in uh, cooking and storage products. Is that considered toxic? Out of all the plastic, silicone is considered the safest um, from everyone I have access to to ask this question. Um, however, that being said, I wouldn't, I mean, it's perfectly fine in baby bottles. You know, people worry about the nipples. Absolutely. Um, but I would argue that if you don't need it for storage, don't use it, but it should not be considered con necessarily toxic. But I just don't trust the combinations. I have earplugs that are silicone and I don't know what's in them from China. And, you know, the idea is that you're never guaranteed the makeup of those chemicals. Um, so my feeling is if you can use other options like glass and stainless steel, better, but certainly don't worry in terms of baby products. And I mean, as I was reading your book, I was and reading some of your slides ahead of time, should we just assume that if we, if a substance, a personal care product, whether a house cleaning product, our carpet, if it has any odor, whether it be a good or a bad odor, should we try to... Well, guess what? Some odors are non, some, some chemicals are so non odorous that you can actually get really sick without even smelling it. And so I kind of try to prep my students and my patients to understand that you don't have to taste it and you don't have to smell it for it to be terribly harmful for you. And so I just try to say, well, look, you know, the new car smell certainly can't be so great for you because it's pungent. Um, but my kids shampoo and conditioner that I'm fighting with them over and I'm changing them out they smell up the entire house. That can't be good either, I don't think. And of course, when I check it on EWG, they're considered meet at middle of the road ratings. So the idea is that, you know, if your body sixth sense tells you it's too pungent, um, it usually a, is a problem, but you want to always check. I always like to check, you know, and get vetted products if I can. So someone asked a question, and this might be, I guess, individual risk versus benefit. You had a slide about hormone replacement therapy um, for breast cancer. Um, oh, in terms of breast cancer. So I think, you know, that's a controversial component to that slide, but I think you have to understand how much estrogen, if it's being balanced by progesterone. So there's, that's a whole conversation based on the drugs that were tested at the time to put that there, but it's really has to do it's more nuanced than that. It just wanted people to be conscious of it and ask their practitioners and know what they're taking. Mm -hmm. Every day I get an email or a text or an Instagram message about a product and I do not comment on products at all. It's it, even within a brand, believe it or not, there can be bad products, even with one scent or one color different, even right. in the brand. 
And this happened, I think, with Burt's Bees like 10 years ago. There was one lip balm that actually had findings of high levels of some type of chemical that the other ones don't. Even with deodorant, I just have a deodorant company that I like where one of them is a one in terms of EWG, it's low rating for risk. And then another scent, you know, totally different scent that smells great is like a five. So you have to vet out each scent, especially with like Axe Body Spray, they're all variable. And I like the kids to see that. So really brands don't always cut it. It's really individual products within a brand, I think is needs to be held to a higher standard too. And that applies also to food because I, I teach in the in our middle and high schools and there's different times where I bring in different products for the students and like one ingredient list is like two ingredients with this one product and, there, and another version of theirs has like 10 ingredients on the list. And so again, you have to, it's not just the brand, but you have to really- you have to do it. But once you get your list of products, I mean, it takes nothing for me to go shopping, nothing. Because I just, I've, I've honed it down. It's taken a while, but it's a journey. I'm still coloring my hair, but I'm doing everything I can other than that, you know, I'm trying to cut down on all my exposures that I have real, you know, low hanging fruit is the way I look at it. So do the best you can do one thing a month, one thing, you know, every other month, get a water filter that might take a month or two, you know, just do it at your own pace. But once it's all locked in, it actually, your life is a lot easier. All right. Well, so fabulous. All right, guys, don't forget, grab this book. Uh, uh, Ailey's links will be um, on our website going forward, uh, the smart human, and again, live a healthier life. And, and we can, if we abide by some of these things that Ellie has uh, taught us today. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening and sharing the information you learned because it's all about all of us. It's a village. So yes, thank you for yeah. having me.